Well, hello and welcome to BTE Media's In Conversation with series. Um, I'm delighted and privileged today to welcome Doug Emsley, CEO of Tarsus Group and Chair of Society of Independent Show Organisers. I know you do other, lots of other stuff as well, but um, we'll come on to that. Um, good afternoon, Doug. How are you today? I'm very good, Dan, and it's, it's great to be here and it's a, an exciting time for the industry. You know, I, th I think that, you know, with the vaccine announcements a week or so ago, uh, I, I think people are now beginning to actually believe that our industry is going to come back. And I think, you know, it's, a, it's been a difficult six months and there's been you know periods where people have doubted, you know, live events. But I, th I think what is quite clear is that there, there is now a path back to live. And, that, and that's really exciting for the industry. Fantastic. And we're, we're definitely going to go into that in more detail in a few minutes. Um, Doug, you've been in the industry. I'm, I'm not going to age you. I'm just going to say for a bit, bit of time um and what if you could just briefly summarize what sort of drives your passion for the industry that you're in exhibitions and publishing etc well uh I, I i don't mind being dated i mean i i I've, I've been in this industry this is my 28th year now and uh i spend or did spend i should say two-thirds of my time uh traveling on planes around the world yeah and and what just fascinates me about our industry is our ability to bring communities together and that there's nothing more exciting than actually going and seeing a show that's busy with people in booths yeah. writing orders. And actually, we are helping to stimulate trade. And, and I think I'm sure we'll cover this yeah. later, but, 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 but it's been one of the big frustrations that generally government hasn't understood that the exhibition industry is going to be the engine that gets the economy going again. Yeah. Uh, and that's what excites me because that's actually what we do. We create markets for people to do business. Yeah, which is uh, very odd that essentially they find that non-essential when it's probably the most essential thing that, <laughs> uh, that, an industry, uh, that a country needs. Um, can you just bring to life uh, in summary for those that... Um, aren't aware of you and I'm sure the few are far between but um, obviously your role as CEO of Tarsus Group can you just explain a bit more about Tarsus please? Yeah well I mean the the, the genesis of, of, of Tarsus goes way back to actually when I started and uh, I worked for a company called Blenheim. Blenheim was the biggest independent organizer in the world at the time um, and I worked for Neville Book who was the chairman of Blenheim um, Blenheim was taken over in 96 by uh, it was UBM uh, and I stayed on for about 18 months as a business integrated and then uh, Neville phoned me up and said I'm starting again do you want to join me um, so I joined Tarsus 22 years ago uh, as the first employee um, oh, wow. and uh, you know I, I sat there in an office on my own um you know and i answered the telephone and, and it's gone full circle you're sitting in your by yourself now <laughs> exactly uh, and uh you know the, the difference this time was I, I didn't make the same mistake this time which when i started i bought three telephones and that they they all used to ring at the same time so uh, uh, sorry I, uh, sorry i interrupted you but yeah so you started by yeah you're one employee yeah Yep. Yeah, um, and uh, you know we 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 built up that business uh, over you know twenty two years, twenty one years actually as a public company, um, and uh, you know we've got eight hundred employees uh, around the world. Uh, we're operational in nineteen countries, and um, you know last year we decided to take the business private, so we're now owned by private equity. We're owned by Charterhouse, and that was. Uh, a 670 million uh, pound transaction so it, it was a, a big transaction at the time um, and that was all predicated on actually we saw lots of opportunities uh, to continue to invest and grow um, and that's that's still the same today you know we, yeah. we, we still see lots of opportunities although you know the model is going to be different going forward and, and, and that's actually what is exciting about our industry in that actually it's very entrepreneurial yep. and actually it's very good at actually seeing opportunities and actually changing and taking advantage of those opportunities. Sure. 
So started with one employee being yourself and now up to, sorry, how many did you say? 800? 800, yeah. So uh, quite a journey. I mean, that's a whole different um, interview that I might do with you another time. Yeah. <laughs> in terms of how that grows to achieve. Um, obviously got to focus on the industry um, as it has been over the last six months. Um, I don't want to do too much in it because we know the decimation that it's had. But I'm keen to ask you, Doug, obviously, as someone that's running a business with um, shows and events and businesses all over the world, I think predominantly in three regions, right? Yeah. Um, when did it first sort of start to affect you? Because in the UK, when I was about to run a show in March, it sort of didn't come on stream that it was going to impact us until mid-February. But speaking to others outside of the UK, it sort of hit earlier. Can you sort of bring to life your experience? Yeah, well, I, I'm very sad because I actually knew exactly when, when it first sort of uh, impacted me, which yeah. was on the 12th of January, uh, right. which is Sunday. Uh, I, I got a phone call from Michael Duck, who runs uh, a big part of Informa in Asia. And he was just sort of asking about, you know, what we were going to do with our shows in Shenzhen. Yeah. Uh, because Informa had taken the decision to uh, postpone uh, their big sign show. Uh, and we had our big automotive aftermarket show coming up roughly at the same sort of time. So, I mean, as I've said to Michael, you know, basically everything was fine up until that point. So I, I really blame him for uh, you know, all, all the COVID impact on our right. business. Um, but, but, but joking aside, it, it was, it was January and yeah. it, it really escalated really quickly. Yeah. Um, and obviously, you know, it was sort of mid-March by the time it sort of hit home here in, in, in the UK um, and then obviously moved ultimately into, into the US very, very quickly. Um, but but, but what, what, what's been really interesting in that China was the first to go in and has, and has been the first to come yeah. out. Yeah. And, you know, we've got a large business in China. We've got, you know, 25% of our business is, is, is in China. And we've been operational there uh, since July. Uh, yeah. We've done 10 shows. Um, and and it, it's really, really interesting in, in terms of, you know, what we're seeing and what the protocols are and how things are running uh, and, and how efficiently the Chinese have been at actually controlling the virus and allowing, you know, businesses to return um, and, and that that is really sort of the opposite of what we've really seen in the West, which have been you know slow to move. It's been pretty chaotic in terms yeah. of trying to get a resumption, um, and you know that that that's an ongoing frustration. Sure, and I, I just wanted to just um, touch upon um, leading a, a company, and obviously it's not just yourself. You've got support structures and business units across the world during the pandemic, and people working from home. And especially because obviously what a lot of tasks have done over the years is obviously buy and build strategy, like M&A. Yeah. So it's quite hard to instill a culture anyway, I guess, because you're, you're building uh, in that respect. How did you go about trying to um, establish a commonality and put those sort of security of, of staff in place sort of mentally, I guess, and you know, in terms of working from home and virtual during this period? Yeah, I mean, we, 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 we've moved... Um, you know, very quickly, um, you know, we set up our senior management team and, and you know, we, we, we met, uh, you know, at least once a week yeah. um, to, to go through all the protocols uh, and basically delegated the, the individual, you know, chief executives within the regions to make the decisions really, really quickly. Yeah. Um, and I think that was really important. Um, and, and similarly, on, on a return to work, it, it, it's, it's been very, very interesting in that actually people went to work from home very, very quickly. That went incredibly smoothly. You know, I, I think, you know, people had concerns about, you know, keeping people motivated, how productive people would be. But actually, none of those fears have been realised. Uh, the, the business has operated very effectively. What's interesting is the return. Right. Um, and, you know, in China, as I said, we've been back operational since July. Uh, basically, if, if I look east at the moment, all of our offices are open and people are back in the office. Yeah. Uh, so basically, that's our offices in China, in Southeast Asia, 
in the Middle East, in Turkey. Uh, if I look west, basically everybody's still working from home. You know, so U UK, US, Mexico, it's all, it's all home working. Um, so I think culturally, it, it's really interesting that the East all went back into the office. There's very little uh, uh, working from home, yeah. whereas in the West, it's all working from home. And it'll be interesting that I think maybe what we'll see in the West is some sort of hybrid working. Um, and I think it's really, really important and, and, and certainly something that's come uh, very clearly from the teams is that they want to meet, they, they, they yeah. want to get together. It's a lot more productive. And actually, if I never have another Zoom meeting again, I'll be very, very happy, you know. But this could, uh, be, our, this could be your last one. Yeah. That, 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 we should make it a good one. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, you know, I, 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 and, and, and it's the, the reason why trade shows will come yeah. back and will come back, come back strongly is, you know, you know, people want to be with other people. It's, it's that creative spark of being together, which you just don't get when you're doing it electronically. Yeah. So talk um, to me about, um, so the shows that have opened um, in China, yeah. Um, and I guess there's others coming on stream at the moment. Can you talk to me about what they currently look like? OK, so in terms of how they're operating and also yeah. whether um, you've still kept this hybrid model of having a virtual element to it as well. Yeah. I mean, I mean, China is a very, very interesting case study because, I mean, there's obviously lots of people talking about what events are going to look yeah. like. You know, people are. Um, you know, hypothesizing what that's going to be like and whether it's going to be hybrid, how long that lasts for, etc. It's really interesting to look at the only market that's really open uh, to any scale, and that is really yeah. China. I mean, there's other markets that are open, but China is really open at scale. And how not only our shows, but industry shows have come back generally is on average, they've come back at about 80% of the size of what they were last year. And Obviously, there's the normal safety um, and uh, protocols that have been put in, as you would yeah. expect. Um, but they generally just look like shows last year, except people have all got masks on. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's what's really, really interesting is that, you know, the minute that actually China went live, there's been no talk about virtual events. There's <laughs> been no there's been no talk about hybrid events yeah so it is just gone bang 100 yeah. percent back live people are trading and no no one is sitting there and talking about the new normal uh it's really really interesting yeah because you think um because i look at it regardless of what the government says in a particular region you as an individual have to want to get up and go somewhere and feel confident yeah. that you're going to be safe and actually it's worthwhile you doing it so you're suggesting in in that territory that people have been mobilized and incentivized to, to come to an event that they that they were previously do you think that's because of the industries that you work within so they're quite specialist or so they miss sort of the, the community that they're within well I, I think it's down to a number of reasons i think that you know china is a big domestic market uh, and actually it's got you know a huge market to service itself so it, it, it's not relying on international travel yeah um, and, or international exhibitors to, uh, to, to come to the show. I mean, obviously there are exceptions. Um, so big domestic market. And if you just look at the travel industry in China, it is back up to the same volumes as it was pre-pandemic. And wow. business travel is, is, is back to that level. The hotels are back to the occupancy levels they were before. So it's really interesting how that has resumed yeah. uh, and resumed quite quickly. Um, and that's what I find fascinating. But... If, if I go to the other big domestic market, which is the US, um, you know, it, it's chaos. Um, and, yeah. and that's a lot to do with, you know, the government structure there. Um, not only the politics with Trump, but actually it, it's very much governed by the states and the right. cities. And they all operate differently. And bluntly, they've been operating along their political lines. So the Republicans... Um, are open, the democratic, you know, states are effectively closed. Um, mm. and, and that's how it, to date it, it, it's really worked. Um, and, and what you've seen there is, you know, some resumption of events, 
um, but very limited. I mean, we, we have run two events in the US physically, um, both of them in Orlando. Um, and, and, and that was very, very interesting in terms of you know, how it worked and, you know, building the confidence in our exhibitors that actually we were going to deliver the audience. Yeah. And it was slightly easier for us to do because the, the two events were in the travel sector and they were hosted buyers. So we actually knew who was coming and yeah. our exhibit knew that they were actually going to have proper business meetings. Yeah. So what about the future for the sort of larger trade shows, which maybe have complementary access, the trade off getting the volume in the whole sort of buying cycle, if you like. Do you think they're going to be sort of last in line to come back in in territories that haven't yet opened? Yeah, I mean, I think it's going to come back in phases. I think yeah. the domestic markets definitely first, uh, the more regional markets um, second and the international uh, big shows are, are definitely going to be last yeah. um, because I mean, if you take places like Germany, Germany actually is open. Yeah. Um, but the problem is around e exhibitor confidence that the buyers that they want to see are actually going to turn up to the show. Yeah. And, and that's going to take time to build uh, that confidence back. And it's just going to take time. Yeah. And it's almost, I guess, in a, in a strange way, I, I, I'm loath to call it a positive, but it's going to force organisers to think about their content proposition even more. Because if someone's going to come to an event, it's going to have to resonate with them even more than before. They're yeah. not going to likely to just say, oh, I might just pop along to that. Would you sort of agree with that? So it's going to actually hopefully make events even better than they, than they were. Well, what's really interesting is the, the recent Explorey research, which was done for, for Ufi and SISO. And, you know, a number of interesting things came out of that. One is obviously the desire for uh, exhibitors to get back face to face the budgets actually they say they're going to commit pretty quickly to come back. But the, the, the thing that really interested the, me the most was from a buyer perspective, that they, they were more keen to understand the quality of the exhibitors that, that were going to be there. Okay. So that they, yeah. they were actually only going to invest their time in coming to a show if we as the organizers could guarantee that there was going to be sufficient and high quality exhibitors for them to see. So that, 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 that's quite an interesting sort of yeah. dynamic change in terms of how they were thinking about coming to show in terms of, you know, they, they would have to be coming to really do proper business with people they wanted to do business with for them to justify yeah. the trip. Which in a funny way, you would have sort of hoped that they did before because that's the whole point of coming. But yeah. now it's even more sort of front and center. Exactly. Yeah, it, it was it was the one thing that they were focused on, which I, yeah. I, I found really, really interesting. And, and you know, us as organisers, you know, obviously we're, we're, we're keen to get a, a, as many exhibitors in, but actually, you know, getting quality buyers has tend to be where we've been focused on. Um, yeah. But actually, yeah, we've got to focus on making sure we've got yeah. good quality exhibitors there. Yeah. Well, that's not a bad thing, clearly. That's no, only absolutely. going to raise it's only going to raise the game and the profile of the shows and our industry in general. So, yeah. as I said, if a positive has come out of it, that that would be one of them. You touched upon virtual and hybrid, whatever that means, because that means fifty different things to fifty different people. Yeah. Um, you know, event organisers. If you've had a successful event, um, high margins do it physically. They always want to do stuff online for for obvious reasons. Do you still see a, see a role though in in virtual um, at all in, in some of the shows? Or is it by territory or sector? Or I, I think it's very much by territory yeah. and sector. I mean, if I, if I take the two extremes, I mean, I've talked about China and yeah. basically no, no one is talking about virtual or hybrid. But if, if I go to one of our other big sectors, which is the medical sector in the US, um, there you've got an audience, which is doctors that are quite conservative uh, and are very happy um, to attend uh, events uh, virtually. Okay. Um, and, you know, we, we've got a big online education business uh, for doctors, and, and that's actually grown strongly through this six-month period uh, as doctors want to consume more education. Um, and the, the other interesting uh, fact is around pharmaceutical companies in that actually 
they have been dedicating more budget into the digital format. Um, and we, we've got a number of very big pharmaceutical companies that have said two interesting things. One is for this year, they will not attend any live events. It will all be virtual. Mm -hmm. uh, and next year, they will only attend if there is a hybrid component to a live event. Uh, and that's actually within their contracts to us in terms of actually they're committing large sums of money to the events, but those are the conditions in which they'll participate, which are, it, it, it's, it's quite interesting how they are thinking about the world. Yeah. So that because maybe that that sort of guarantees the eyeballs in a funny way or what, what, what's what's their thing? Well, the, well, I think their thinking is that the, the, the doctor audience will be slow to come yeah. back to. Okay. events and and actually at the moment this is their only channel yeah. um, to get doctors um so they they, they, they want to make sure that they have as an efficient um channel or channels as they can possibly get yeah but it's chicken and egg isn't it as organizers yeah. because we don't want to give too much away online <laughs> yeah. and make people feel comfortable that they never come back or feel like yeah. they need to come back but then yeah. we can't ignore also the their yeah. needs as well um but, but sorry. i think the the, the great thing I would say, you know, as a positive about about virtual uh, and the hybrid model going forward is our ability to interact with bigger audiences and our ability to build data. Yeah. Um, and we, we've definitely seen that as one of the big plus points. But I, I think the big challenge that people haven't really addressed on hybrid going forward is your experience as a consumer is going to be totally different if you are live yeah. or if you're, if you're sitting in your room. And you cannot, in my view, offer up the same experience because it just doesn't work. You, you're going to have to tailor it and you're going to have to integrate it into the whole event. And that's the bit that people haven't figured out yet. Yeah, because there's no serendipity online, is there? There's no like, yeah. you know, chance meetings. And a lot of the things I've attended and possibly feel the same they've all got great meeting software, but do we use it? Um, it? Unless it's a hosted buyer's event online, so that's the only reason why you're there. I find that people aren't using that sort of meeting software on actually yeah. you know, connecting online. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll give you a very live yeah. example. I, I've just been at a virtual meeting for the last couple of days, um, uh, an, an industry one, and I haven't had, and I haven't even looked at, doing any virtual appointment yeah. Yeah. or interacting in any of the networking tools whereas you know i went to this event last year and yeah. basically i spent 75 percent of my time networking and yeah. having me outside of the conference yeah. so my, my, my whole way of consuming if yeah. you like experience has been totally different yeah and that's where i guess they can complement each other there's no point yeah. in forcing it on a platform where people don't want to you know use that particular tool um you mentioned industry bodies and obviously your your chair of um society of independent show organizers yeah so um can you just in summary sort of bring to life how the industry bodies in general including aeo and ufi that I'm, you know i know you're mm. involved with have sort of worked together and dealt with governments to yeah. sort of you know move the uh the industry forward well, I mean, the, 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 the whole way that the exhibition industry has, has, has worked with government has been really, really interesting. I mean, if, if you look at the best examples, you'd have to say it's probably the Chinese and the Germans. And that's because the governments have historically been involved in our industry. The relationships are there. It, yeah. it, it's been pretty easy because they, they've been able to understand our issues and have responded. Whereas if, if, if I look at the, the, the US, which I'm heavily involved with, um, you know, you've got that sort of federal government and the state government and the city governments, yeah. and it's very political because of the elections that have just been going on, et cetera. And, you know, SISO was set up really to actually create a networking opportunities for the CEOs of the organizing community to get together once or twice a year to network, talk about industry issues. It was never a lobbying body uh, and, and, and never tried to do that. Um, but out of this crisis, uh, that's changed. And 
Um, a body was set up uh, really by Bob Priestack from Freeman called Go Live Together, which okay. was a coalition of bringing all of the different bodies in the US together to actually advocate to get our industry open again. Yeah. Uh, and, and Bob approached SISO to take the lead, which was very, very interesting because, you know, he believed, and I think correctly, that SISO was entrepreneurial and could actually move quicker than any of the other associations in, in America. And um, you know, we, we agreed to actually take the lead um, and we went out and we raised half a million dollars um, from the industry wow. uh, associations and from the big organizers, um, basically to set up a campaign to advocate to get the industry open again. Yeah. Uh, so we, we hired uh, one of the top lobbying firms in Washington and we hired one of the top, um, you know, uh, communication companies. Um, and, and I mean, w w what have we learned? I mean, I think we, we, we've learned basically the roadmap of actually working with, you know, the federal and state governments um, and also to communicate to the industry. And I mean, I know there's a, a lot of frustration with the, within the industry that, you know, things haven't happened with government in the UK and yeah. similarly in the, in the US. And I think a key part of our task is to communicate what is going on, what we're trying to do. And I know that the EU have been doing that. And I think Chris has done a, a great job, actually. And, and I, I, I think the other point I would make is it, it's not all about the associations. And what we've done in, in the U.S. is we've engaged what we call a, a grassroots campaign is to get everybody with an interest in our industry to get involved and not yeah. just rely on the association. Yeah. And, and similarly, I mean, I, I would say in, in the U.K., it, it's not all about the AEO. I, I think anybody who's interested you know, should get involved. And I think, you know, you know, people like, you know, what Trevor Foley has done and Julian Agostini, you know, they haven't relied on Chris, you know, yeah. they, they, they've gone out and done their things. And yeah. I think that's great. And I think that's what we've got to encourage in the industry is that we're all in this together. We're all frustrated and we shouldn't be sort of blaming the, the association yeah. bodies. We should be all getting together and doing our bit. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. I interviewed Chris um, a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, before that interview, if I'm honest, you know, I've spoken to people, as you said, they were bit frustrated and think yeah. the organization did this and that and maybe I was partly one of them but I, when I interviewed him I had a massive newfound respect for him and what he had done because you know he told me that the, the food and hospitality industry in the UK really had seven full-time lobbyists so they were so far like that in terms of their relationships with government and as mm. you said and you, you put it you know succinctly that these organizations were not lobbying bodies they weren't set up to do that Mm. And so it's easy to say, oh, okay, there's this big brand called the AEO. Well, they must mm. be representing everybody and let, we'll let them get mm. on with it. But obviously that, that's, that's not the case. And I think, you know, there's been so many good community initiatives as well mm. uh, in the UK specifically, and I'm sure elsewhere. Um, yeah. I just want to move on um, a little bit to private equity. Um, obviously, Tarsus um, was bought, acquired by Charterhouse for a not insignificant sum um last year yeah um yeah. actually august we completed last year yeah just over a year so i've listened to many talks with phil saw obviously my old chairman at, um close to steel and he gave us the potted history of private equity coming on board into the exhibition space i guess recently you know t last mm -hmm. 10 or 15 years yeah um do you think what's happened is going to knock that confidence or do they see it as, you know, clearly it's not the, the industry's fault and it will come back as it was? I, I as it knocked the confidence, um, I don't think so. I mean, I think that, I mean, what we're seeing with private equity is that they've, they've spent the last six months sort of, you know, sorting out their own portfolio companies. Yeah. And I think what you'll see next year is they, they will progressively get more active ag again in the market. Um, I think what will be different is that I think the private equity model has been is that they like, you know, pure play trade show businesses. Yeah. Uh, and I think what you'll see change is that it'll be more going back to 
what we had in in you know the 80s and 90s when you had sort of more diverse media groups um so it, it will go back to you know servicing your community yeah. being on the channel which will be primarily trade show and digital yeah um and, and i think that will be the change and um you know i i, I think private equity still like our business yeah um, and I think they'll continue to invest in it. And and you've seen a very, very clear example of that with, you know, Clarion and Blackstone yeah. backing their recent acquisition of Quartz, which is a great business. Yeah. And I know that uh, Tars has been active. Obviously, you took over the other half of a JV with a Chinese company. Um, and I know yourself have invested in Raccoon with the, with the, yeah. the running show. I guess also for a company, if, if there's cash reserves available and if private equity are there to build um you know significant value in the business that multiples whereas they might have been at x will be at what you know will be x minus potentially given the extra cost that companies have to take on in terms of being covid secure and that sort of stuff which pre presents opportunities right yeah i mean i i think what gives private equity confidence is you know you just have to look at the public markets yeah. um you know, so, I mean, take Informa. I mean, Informa were one of the first companies to go out and get the support of their shareholders. It was, you know, it, it was a billion pounds. I mean, it was a very, very big yeah. show of support from their shareholders. Uh, and the minute that Pfizer announced yeah. Yeah. the vaccine, you, you saw them dramatic jump in their share price. Yeah. And actually, the, the, their valuations today are actually you know getting back up to where they were moving uh, historically so i i think i think the current sort of if you like discount on on values will over time um erode and and i think you'll see them come back maybe not to the the, the glittering heights that they were yeah. but i i think they'll come back to sensible levels sure and in terms of tarsus's uh, look in terms of possible acquisitions and investment you mentioned digital before and obviously um more going back to sort of uh, diverse groups is that yeah. where you're going to look to invest whether it's you know a digital channel or digital community and then bolting onto what you have or what's yeah i mean i mean very much i mean i, I mean I'll, I'll take our medical business uh, as an example, and it's been our most successful in terms of, of, of digital. You know, we, we're seeing good growth in our online education business. Um, about three, four weeks ago, we, we bought um, a business in the uh, dermatology uh, area, um, which uh, we've converted pretty quickly into quite good uh, um, digital revenues. Um, and, and that's a space that we, we see structurally will actually continue to grow both live and digitally. Yeah. So we're continuing to invest there. We're, we're even, you know, considering actually buying a software company. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so, you know, we, we're looking at doing different things that we wouldn't have done six months ago. Yeah. Um, find a few questions, if that's okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> Given that it's your last interview ever, we might as well, <laughs> might as well make it last. <laughs> um, what event are you looking forward to attending that you haven't obviously managed to attend? It doesn't have to be one of your group events, but I don't know whether, you know, someone I spoke to said they always went to Comic-Con and got dressed up as Spider-Man. So, yeah. <laughs> so I don't know what, what sort of event are you looking to, whether it's a rock concert or whatever. Um, I mean, I... I I would say from a, a personal perspective, yeah. I'm actually really looking forward to going back and watching uh, my son play rugby, actually. Okay, uh, yeah. Uh, and, that's, and that's something that, I, that I've missed. And I, th I think during this pandemic, I think the thing, you know, obviously we're concerned about our, our colleagues and, yeah. and, you know, employees, but actually it's been the young people who have been dramatically impacted and, and what they've been able to do. And, you know, so... I'm looking forward to, you know, standing on the touchline and watching him. Uh, in terms of trade shows, um, you know, you know, getting back to probably Dubai and seeing the air show. Um, yeah. Um, um, you know, that, that, that's just such a, a fantastic show visually to see. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, uh, just generally, actually, I'll just be happy to get back on a plane, <laughs> being at a trade show and actually seeing that whole dynamic work again. Sure. So you've actually missed traveling in a funny way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's it's 
it, it's been the longest I've been at home, and, and, yeah. I, and I, I, I'm, I'm surprised my wife hasn't chucked me out yet. <laughs> I just stay in one room and don't move. <laughs> <laughs> um, and in terms of your own personal growth is the wrong word, but we all still develop as individuals, but I guess, you know, you get to a certain point and you sort of done everything and you, you know how to do it. Obviously the last six to eight months, I've spoken to a lot of people that have obviously got a lot of years in the industry. How have you sort of grown? What other sort of skills do you think have developed over this time? Well, I, I, I wouldn't say I've developed sort of new skills. Yeah. I, 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 I think it's become really, really important, uh, and it always has been. It's just around sort of communication, yeah. uh, fast decision making, um, because people want certainty, and I think people want to know what is going on. And I mean, it, it, it's it's interesting because we do uh, every two weeks we do an update around the world. I do uh, virtual town halls, and I do them yeah. sort of regionally. I do videos out to the staff because all of the feedback coming back is, I mean, I know and my central team know everything that's going on, sure. but actually it's easy to forget that somebody in China or somebody in, in yeah. the US, they, they, they don't know what's going on outside of their own business. Yeah. And they're, they're really engaged and really interested. And, you know, my, my senior management team, we had a discussion about how often you know we should speak and and they were really adamant that they 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 liked the interaction because it was their their only uh way of finding out what was going on and exchanging information so you know the us team wanted to know what was going on in china you know what were the protocols what were their experiences what were the learnings and they were adapting that in in, in their business uh so i i, I think it's become even more important. And I think one of the good things about Zoom is that actually we will communicate a lot more. Yeah. Um, uh, and that is a very good thing, I think. Yeah. And finally, um, you could choose not to answer this question, but um, you're on a desert island. Um, what two or three people from the industry are you taking with you and why? <laughs> oh, uh, well, definitely number one I would take with me would be Neville Book. I mean, I, I've worked with Neville um, for 27 out of those 28 years, yeah. obviously, in the last year since, you know, he's retired. Um, but, you know, when we were together, we, we talked every day and, you know, and talked about industry issues and strategy. So I, I, I would definitely take him. Yeah. Um, Given, given my love for uh, uh, for running, I would definitely take uh, Mike uh, Seaman. Uh, he, he's come up four times now. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's gonna be, there's got to be a lot of different islands. <laughs> he's in demand. Yeah, yeah <laughs> absolutely. And, yeah. You know, if, in, uh, I, if I want to talk about running, I, I can talk to Mike because at home, my, my wife and the kids just look to the ceiling. So <laughs> <laughs> I know you're a keen runner. Absolutely. And anyone I, else? Finally. And finally, I, I would I, I would actually take uh, David Adrain with me. I mean, I think I I I I became chairman of yeah. SISO earlier this year. I was meant to chair three board meetings, and that was it. And it's become my other full time job. And actually, I really sort of appreciate actually all the work that he's done for the industry. Yeah. And actually, he gets so much done. And I've been in some of those association meetings, and I know how hard that is. Yeah. And, and you know, actually having someone with that ability to get things done in our industry is, is, is a, a rare skill. Yeah. Thank you, Doug Emsley. Thank you so much for your time today. Dan, it's been a pleasure. Nice to speak.